This lecture is going to focus upon uh, some highlights of the chapters 8 and 9 in Hepworth and in the Cornoyer workbook chapter 10. Uh, there's a few things I'm bringing in from that chapter as well. The two, the two uh, texts really kind of work in parallel here covering much the same material but there are a few ideas in Cornoyer that I wanted to add into what the Hepworth uh, group is saying in, in their text as well. Now this uh, this particular lecture really, uh, although I believe you'll find that it mentions the environment and person and environment and the context, uh, really kind of focuses much more upon the intrapersonal and the local interpersonal uh, factors in, in assessment, much less on the larger issue about the context, which uh, we will cover when we look at uh, that chapter in the Gambrel text. So uh, just a kind of a way as a little graphic from, I believe it's from the Hepworth text, about the areas for attention in assessing strengths and problems. And, and you can see that there are a number of different things that bring clients to us as mentioned here. And problems as seen by potential clients. Remember, we talked about clients and potential clients. And, and uh, so we're really, in the assessment phase, you know, this is still somebody who very much may just be still a, um, a potential client. And some of the problems and challenges, uh, as opposed to the strengths and resources that the client will have. One of the concepts that we want to talk about early here is about diagnosis. And diagnoses are labels or terms that, that uh, might be applied to one or one situation. And the intent of the diagnosis, uh, now most, most diagnoses that you're going to deal with um, in, in the social work profession comes from the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, now the DSM-5. Uh, the textbook refers to the DSM-4, DSM-4R, I believe, in different places. The five replaced that here within the last uh, year or two. and and. Um, Although they, the DSM-5 the supposedly, it will change some things, for instance, in changing it from a multi-axis diagnosis to a single uh, axis uh, diagnosis. And there are pros and cons to that if, you, if, you, um, if you're into the DSM and, and uh, what it all means. But in any event, um, w whether you're talking about the four or the five, the five is what's being used today, of course. Um, th there, there's a lot of controversy around the DSM. Each uh, step along the way, they, um, the reviewers who are contributing to the DSM and to the changes believe that it brings it closer and closer to uh, more of a medical explanation for issues and more concrete kinds of, of things. But that's very much open to debate. Uh, but the intent of this, at least, is to provide what is referred to as a shorthand categorization based on criteria specifically defined, um, reflecting really a medical condition. And, and um, the idea is, is that this uh, categorization enables practitioners to communicate back and forth about what's going on with a particular diagnosis. And the next practitioner knows a little bit about what it is, th th in theory, to look for and what to expect and how to approach treatment. Again, could be could be good, could be bad, but but that's the basically the issue behind it. So um, the uh, DSM is is a tool, and and it is only a tool. It should not be your Bible, and and it it does provide some help in understanding and formulating uh, what the practitioners who are doing the evaluation see uh, is the disorders in in thinking or emotions. I, I actually had a, a mentor in, in Florida many, many years ago who went into private practice and was a psychologist and had determined he was going to do psychological evaluations without diagnoses until he discovered that he was not going to get reimbursed or paid by any of the insurance companies without a DSM and, and without a diagnosis. And this, these diagnoses become very, very important uh, for reimbursement purposes. And it's one of the reasons you're going to run into it a lot, particularly if you wind up in private practice someday. But even if you don't, um, it, and the the issue, of course, with the DSM, one of the issues is that the focus is on the individual and uh, really not a lot of attention given to the social, physical, or person and environment issue. Uh, really, is about psychosocial 
contextual and environmental factors uh, only in the narrative descriptions, and but it really doesn't necessarily connect to the specific diagnosis itself. They aren't. They aren't. Uh, they are considered to be criteria for making the diagnosis, so to speak, but they, they, they sometimes are addressed in the narrative that is associated with the diagnosis. Now, a system that you're very familiar with and we are familiar with in the social work profession uh, is the person and environment system or PIE system. I don't think we're supposed to call it the PI system, but um, and, and the, the PIE system provides practitioners um, the opportunity to consider the input and participation of the clients. And, and uh, it gives you the opportunity to classify problems with, with uh, four different areas of factors in the client's life that includes social functioning problems, environmental problems, mental health problems, and physical health problems and strengths. Now, these factors, you know, in a certain respect, if you're familiar with the DSM, previous to DSM-5, you know, in a way these these call to mind the the different axes that uh, for diagnoses that existed in in the DSM before, but but uh, this is kind of more from a social work perspective, and so you are looking at social fun how people get along in their world, the environmental problems, which uh, you know in a in a broad sense can include all those contextual kinds of things that that uh, we talk about in in making a good assessment. Of course, there's the mental health issues and the physical health problems. So all of these things are considered in the person and environment system. We're called upon to assess a number of different things, not only uh, to do a formal assessment, let's say, for admission. And sometimes you'll do this, you, you, particularly, you know, we're, we're called upon to do social histories. And we t I'll touch on this a little later um, in, uh, well, actually, at the end of this, at this particular lecture. But uh, but a lot of times when we're called into assessment, there, there are specific things that are happening. And I believe it is uh, our training in environmental influences and how it affects the individual that uh, explains why it is that oftentimes we're called into situations such as when there is violence towards self or others or uh, physical or sexual abuse, domestic abuse, exploitation of vulnerable individuals, issues about poverty and inequality, prejudices and discriminations, as well as mental illness and substance abuse. So, so uh, these are all areas that at one time or another, you may be involved in, in providing assessments, whether a formal or informal assessment um, in, in the course of your work. And when you talk about cultural competence, um, again, I think uh, at one point, you know, we talked about this, that to be culturally competent perhaps is, is a, a goal that is unachievable because to be competent in all the different cultures in the world is, is something that, that uh, well, it's just pretty impossible to do. So to be culturally informed, at least, is, is a good way to look at this. Um, and, and we do need to have a knowledge of cultural norms, a level of acculturation, you know, how if, if it is an individual, if we're talking about an immigrant, for instance, you know, uh, how acculturated are they? How, how well integrated into the dominant culture are they? How much are they still involved with their, with their culture of origin? Those kinds of things. Language differences are a big thing. And of course, uh, sometimes you may need to bring in an interpreter in order to ensure that you are uh, you know, actually understanding the client and, and the client understands you. We uh, need to have the ability to differentiate between what is an individual attribute and what's culturally linked. Um, to in in uh, many cultures around the world, uh, for instance, you know the concept of adolescence. An adolescent is an adolescent in just about every culture. Although adolescents are different, the the uh, transition is a different experience in in some cultures. There are also common attributes to an adolescent that are pretty consistent around the world through all the cultures. So that's you know what's individual, what's cultural. Uh, we need to to uh, take the initiative to seek out needed information. That's where we want to have cultural humility to, to be a cultural learner and to ask questions of our clients and understand the ways in which the differences in cultures might affect the assessment process. Um, another thought, by the way, about the person and environment uh, evaluation is that the concept of goodness of fit is how well does the client fit into the culture in which he or she is situated is also another consideration in the cultural the cultural assessment 
here's another graphic um, I think this is from yeah it is it's from the Hepworth text uh, framework for assessment and uh, you know you can kind of use this to, to uh, plug in if you want a, a visual kind of way of, of understanding things which a lot of us like you know you can plug in the strengths that are related to individual factors and the strengths regarding environmental factors and the deficits that kind of thing so it's just a way of, of seeing that this is sort of a multi-dimensional assessment it's not linear by any stretch you're going to bring your knowledge uh, uh, to the assessment this this will the knowledge of the types of, of problems that the uh, client is bringing to you is having knowledge of those things of course is going to help you understand the nature of the problem and maybe what to do about it um, and and gives you an opportunity to aid in the factors that contribute to and, and sustain or aggravate those problems and you also want to uh, bring theory and what what orient what uh, theoretical orientations uh, will play a larger role in the structure of the assessment and the conclusions that you draw so that that uh, your theoretical approach a lot of times is going to shape the kind of assessment that you do sometimes that's set by your agency sometimes it's something that's up to you to come up with but but something you want to be careful about is you don't want to oversimplify the problem and objectify the client through through a knowledge and theories um, and and you want to keep an open mind because because uh, you know, following a single framework might inhibit you from really pursuing new knowledge and interventions and that's the thing of course that Gambrel talks about all the time is the pursuit of knowledge and 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 looking at things from a different angle here are some areas to explore during a problem assessment so that you know aside from after opening questions uh, you may be you may be establishing rapport, although hopefully you've done that already before you begin an assessment. But uh, at a minimum, at least explaining some of the purposes of the um, of the assessment and perhaps as asking some neutral kinds of questions that might help the client uh, be set at ease some in, in uh, his or her interactions with you. Maybe ex explanation of what the uh, you know what the assessment's all about, um, and then. The questions you're going to do is identifying the problem and how it is expressed um, ask about the other people you know expand beyond the individual to how the interactions of other people and the systems in the client's life what does the client need and want uh, what are the stressors uh, that are associated with kind of typical kinds of, of life transitions and, and such what uh, questions might be there pertaining to cultural societal social class factors those are things that are part of the contextual assessment that I think are very very important to consider and on and on and on and on down this list here again you know it's it it isn't necessary for me to read these to you but these are the kinds of things that you're going to explore when you when you go through an assessment well we've already covered that let's go back to this So the, the problems that you do run into and the strengths of the client and the resources available really all result from the interactions among the, the individual uh, persons around that person and the systems in which they live. So, and there is a reciprocal effect in the system so that um, they, they, um, the effects of the, between these two systems can be both positive and negative. And it isn't just that the, the environment affects the client as, as you know we we know but the client affects the environment as well and the they are both a contributor and a recipient of the nature of the interactions with other individuals around them we we impact our environment and and our relationships as those relationships and as those environments impact us and so it's it's worth kind of looking at both both angles on that as you as you go through the assessment now we're going to look we're going to spend a number of slides looking at the interpersonal factors involved in in uh, an assessment and here are some of the things that uh, we're going to be looking at but th what this does is it looks at ways in which those factors affect the interaction of the individual with people and institutions in the environment but it is kind of a snapshot and we'll come back to that analogy I think in in uh, um, another lecture so just keep in mind the snapshot thing there and as, as is 
one of the things that social workers do, you know, we want to emphasize strengths. We want to make sure that the strengths uh, are are part of the assessment and are highlighted because this does give, uh, first of all, it gives preeminence to the client's understanding the facts and, and, and helping to determine what it is that the client wants. Um, but it also uh, gives us an opportunity to see where that client's strengths are in, in his or her interactions with the world around them. So first we look at the biophysical functioning. The factors in that assessment includes our physical characteristics and how the, how the individual presents, appearance, dress, grooming. If you've, if you've read assessments and evaluations, a lot of times you'll say that, you know, he was appropriately dressed and neatly groomed and those kinds of things. And, and while on, a, on the one hand, this seems very superficial, on the other, it, 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 uh, it is uh, thought to reflect the client's uh, ability to, uh, you know, to respond to other people around them and, and to uh, approach situations appropriately or not. You know, it gives them a sense of their social consciousness, so to speak. Um, their physical health, one of the things we always want to make sure we do is to rule out medical sources of difficulties. And, and if we know about that, does the client have access to appropriate uh, care if necessary? Has the client had the evaluations that are needed? Um, sometimes, but uh, well, I, a, a thing to mention here, a good example of this is um, our thyroid issues, which uh, oftentimes go uh, incorrectly or undiagnosed for some time with uh, with uh, people and particularly with adolescents for instance uh, and there are a whole host of, of things that the uh, thyroid problems cause in terms of energy level and activity level and attentional capacities and those kinds of things it looks a lot like hyperactivity or attention deficit disorder or or other kinds of disorders and if a good physical evaluation isn't pursued uh, a lot of times you'll find that uh, teenagers are being treated for ADHD when they should be being treated for uh, you know, thyroid malfunctions. And, and it's an entirely different treatment, of course. And, and um, it, in, in many respects, it's one of those situations where we wind up harming instead of helping. And so we want to always make sure that we rule out medical sources of difficulties. Also, that we respect uh, preferred methods of treatment interventions and in working with Alaska Native population, for instance, you know, this is often uh, a major consideration, you know, with the, the individuals who, uh, who uh, turn to shamans and folk healers and those kinds of things, as well as the importance of, of uh, caregivers in, in all of this as well. Uh, we, we also want to make an assessment of the use and abuse of medication, alcohol and drugs. Um, and and sometimes you know you'll have a client who has a, a mental health diagnosis as well as a alcohol a substance abuse diagnosis uh, we call that core comorbidity uh, or dual diagnosis and and uh, there are facilities there are programs there are treatment approaches that are uh, more skilled at at, a, at dealing with dual diagnosis clients than others and this is something that's uh, uh, important to to keep in mind as you if you if you see both both problems coming up in, in assessing uh, substance abuse it, the the text points out that you know you have to be uh, use your good skills in in asking questions uh, being direct and compassionate and but also non-judgmental and empathic in in uh, in asking these questions because uh, it's very often that substance abusing clients have underlying feelings of um, well, shame and hopelessness, like it says, uh, maybe anger and even ambivalence. You know, uh, in, in child protection, I've seen many, many times uh, how powerful the substance abuse, uh, the addiction has been when parents are really unable or just not certain they want to give up their their uh, use of substances, even though it, it uh, results in a loss of their custody of their children. I don't want to oversimplify that issue either because sometimes it isn't that they don't want to, but that they're not able to marshal the strengths and forces to do that. I understand that, but that just tells you a little bit about the power of addictions. For cognitive perceptual functioning, we, we, uh, we look at intellectual functioning. Is the client able, uh, able to understand abstractions? That's an important point, by the way, because... Uh, uh, a lot of what you do, if you're if you're treating client in a one-to-one -one kind of a thing, 
there's a lot of discussion involves abstractions and, and so you want to make sure the client can really relate to what's being talked about. Can the client think logically? Um, what is his or her lack of, or level of uh, acad uh, academic achievement? What, what level of their vocabulary are they able to respond to? What is their judgment? What, what, uh, what in their life suggests how, uh, how well their judgment functions? You know, do they, do they make uh, bad decisions when it comes to behavior? You know, they, uh, I can think of, um, one boy who, who, uh, moved out on his, uh, uh, his parents and the very next day quit his job because he wanted a better job, but didn't have another job to support himself. Now that's a poor judgment there for sure. And uh, oftentimes you see errors in, in judgment or deficiencies in judgment connected to things such as um, uh, finances and relationships and, and so on. Reality testing, are they oriented to time, person and place? Uh, this is a lot of times, you know, can you name the last three presidents? Uh, there's a lot of people probably that can't even do that. But, but uh, um, you know, uh, those kinds of things to, to make sure that they, they, they really are, you know, reality testing is good, that they understand cause and effect and, and that kind of thing. Are their thoughts coherent? Uh, is it, are they fragmented? Uh, those kinds of things. On and on and on. Here you see the many different concepts involved in uh, in the cognitive evaluation or assessment, I should say. For affective functioning, uh, the, of course, our feelings are affected by our thoughts, and and our feelings also influence our behavior, and so they're they're sort of central to many different things. And uh, sometimes that is the, it is those emotions, strong emotions or feelings that bring people. Uh, to to seek help you know they they feel maybe out of control or or even constricted for that matter and it's impacting their their relationships in a negative way and so you you assess in this area uh, what kind of emotional self-control they have and you know you some some of that may be demonstrated in front of you others may be given to you in self-reported reports of others around them how they how they manage themselves in different situations particularly in stressful situations but also in their close relationships as well do they have a healthy a healthy degree of uh, emotional expression a range of emotions and um, I, I think to a certain extent some of this is gender related in that um, Males are typically socialized to have a more constricted range of emotions. And that doesn't mean that the range of emotions is healthy for males, but, but oftentimes that socialization is the thing that results in a more restricted range of emotions and creates an awful lot of problems for males. And, and likewise, the expectation that women be able to, um, to handle a wide range of emotions and to express a wide range of emotions creates problems for them as well in, in relationships. Affect, is it appropriate uh, for the for the situation? And another thing, of course, with with uh, with emotions as well, we always want to make an assessment for suicide, particularly in situations where clients are brought to us in troubling or um, uh, crisis situations. This can be very critical when they express depressive symptoms or, or feelings of hopelessness. And there are signs here of the differences, you know, the uh, some of the signs that are thrown off by children and adolescents differ from what adults uh, will often will often demonstrate. And sometimes, um, well, one thing that's sort of a paradox, you know, is a lot of times clients who have made the decision to commit suicide often feel better and relieved and, and will come in telling you, oh, no, we've been, I, I feel just great. I've been feeling better the last few days. And, and, then, and uh, having made the decision finally to what they want to do, they it's sort of a release to them. And so you want to be cautious about that. And in, in, uh, in when you hear a client telling you that, you know, they've been feeling really great lately, because that can sometimes be a bad sign, uh, paradoxically. So behavioral functioning is, is another thing. And, and uh, Gambrel goes to quite a bit of uh, quite an extent in her text about about uh, uh, analyzing behavior and, you know, observing behavior. Uh, and and um, 
I'm skipping a lot of that in 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 this course because uh, it's it's really much more involved than anything we can cover in this course, and particularly when you're uh, reading about it crammed in with a lot of other kinds of information that's coming at you. And so, um, but but behavioral assessments are something that I think if you approach them knowledgeably um, and with some training can really give you a very good um, idea of what. Of, of what's what's going on in the client's life and again remember the relationship the behavior of the relationship is reciprocal in its effect it shapes the behaviors of other people impacts the environment just as much as other people in the environment shape the behavior so we we want to be sure that we're skillful in determining these functional and dysfunctional patterns of behavior uh, one of the things, that, and and again, you know, that's something that uh, that uh, we'll talk, we'll touch on with the Gambrel um, textbook some more, and uh, but but not fully. And so it's something that I encourage you to to look for opportunities to get trained in in behavioral um, behavioral treatment and interventions. Um, <clears throat> aggression is one of those things you want to make sure that you you assess when you're doing behavioral functioning. Uh, aggression can be directed at the social worker and particularly if you're uh, leaving the the office if you're if you're working in the field and you're meeting a new client one of the things you always want to do is if at all possible is to have a client history and that it includes if if you can access that uh, criminal history and you know criminal histories are things that aren't uh, you you can look at the court uh, court records you can look up and see you know the kinds of things people have been brought to court for but that doesn't always tell you everything that goes on in a client's history and uh, and also doesn't reflect the reality of a client situation. Now, for instance, you know, uh, a lot of times when um, men are brought to court or charges are brought against uh, an, an, a male for domestic violence, the charges are dropped or dismissed in court. And, and a lot of times that's because the victim doesn't show up because the victim's, you know, just damn afraid to, to show up or, or won't stand up to the uh, to the perpetrator. In fact, may have already returned to the perpetrator um, for a number of different factors, which would be on the scope of this discussion. But but um, you you can't always take what you see in the court docket or the court records uh, at face value by any means. And and sometimes act, being able to access the actual criminal history you can see patterns of things that maybe don't show up in the court. Um, and just because the charges have been dismissed doesn't mean something didn't happen and that's a very important thing when particularly when it comes to uh, situations such as um, such as domestic violence and and for that matter sexual abuse um, so so uh, anyway you know we want to we want to see what the risk of aggression is against you before you put yourself into situations as much as possible whenever you can but also you want to assess these factors of course for the client not only in terms of self-harm but in terms of harming others and and uh, as i think we've already mentioned you know we have an obligation to report when an individual makes a credible threat to harm others because of the tarasov uh, uh, case so we have, we have we have to identify potential victims so we assess risk of aggression otherwise you know through the kinds of factors here the, what kind of violence is in the person's history what history is there any social behaviors any head injuries head injuries sometimes can uh, you know closed uh, um, um, closed head injuries can can oftentimes result in uh, you know a loss of self-control in terms of emotions very very um, unexpectedly at times. How does the client uh, interact with the worker and with others? Uh, what kind of difficulties exist in relationships? What's going on psychologically? All these uh, have something to do with the risk of aggression. You know, is the individual using substances actively? Is the individual suffer manic states at times? Do they have psychotic breaks? Any personality disorders which predict aggression? Again, um, with those labels, we want to be very careful not to make assumptions about clients. All right, so I, I'm not, I don't want to be talking out of both sides of my mouth, but at the same time, if those diagnoses have been made, that is something that perhaps opens a door, a window or whatever that tells you to look at it more closely. Um, is the client high? 
is the client suffering from dementia? Is, you know, is there a history of head trauma? Is there a history of violence? What is the current situation? What's, what's the client's mood? Is he able to concentrate or not? Uh, is adhering to medication regimens? Sometimes if they're not, that is an indication uh, that, you know, the, whatever the medication is managing, may, they, they may lose control there. Um, preoccupied with sex, recently released from, uh, from prison. All those kinds of factors are things that you might want to look at, what well, you do want to look at when you're assessing behavioral function and the risk of aggression. <clears throat> Excuse me. Motivation, another thing to assess. A lot of times people come to you with this this idea that you know their their lives are out of their hands. You see this a lot of times with individuals, uh, young people in particular that have grown up in foster care and go from home to home, which is sadly often the situation with kids in the child welfare system. They begin to recognize that there isn't much they can do to you know to get control of their lives, and and so they they kind of get this learned this sense of learned helplessness where they they just don't feel that they can impact anything important. Um, now we talked about the um, um, motivational interviewing and the stages of uh, of change or or whatever willingness to change and and. Uh, here again are the uh, the five levels of pre-contemplation and on through maintenance uh, that are that are uh, worthy of considering when we assess motivation. What stage is the client um, existing in? Does the client know that there's a problem but doesn't want to change it or doesn't recognize that there's a problem at all, denies the existence of a problem and, and really seems to believe there is no problem? Does the client want to make a commitment to change? Those kinds of things are important in, in figuring out whether or not you have a, you know, a prospective client uh, or a client. And again, you know, a lot of times, uh, as I believe it was Gabriel told us, that a lot of times we think we're working with clients when we're really working with resistors. We shouldn't kid ourselves in this. We can figure this out some in this in this particular part of the assessment. A motivational interviewing is something that I I hope at some point you'll have the opportunity to get some intensive training in in, uh, in this technique and uh, it's mentioned more in the literature than it was for many years and and um, this is another thing I think I mentioned to you already started really I think grows out of the substance abuse treatment field and as many many of the techniques that we have is coming from that field where because of the fact that 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 uh, population has a uh, well um, you know a lack of commitment to change oftentimes when they come come to treatment uh, a lot of times they're sent there against their will and um, they you know the people in that field have have kind of learned and and developed techniques to engage individuals who are involuntary and and to a certain extent unwilling or or doubtful about their willingness to to participate and and uh, motivational interviewing is a, is a very great technique that uh, you know, is, is person-centered and, and addresses the ambivalence about change that clients often have. And what it, what they do that by, by uh, what we call highlighting discrepancies. What is it the client says they want in their life uh, against what it is that's actually happening in their lives or what they're actually doing? What, what does the client say uh, their goal is and how does that differ from what's happening in their lives? And do they do they uh, do they want to change that or not? And that's sort of by enhancing or developing those discrepancies, you can perhaps move the client uh, in further up in the stages of change. That at least is the theory, and and it's also been introduced, by the way, in um, child protection circles in in Alaska and many other states as well in the last few years, and uh, very helpful there. So here's a little nod to environmental. There's actually a couple of slides here about uh, assessing environmental systems. And so we, we look a little bit at the contextual um, nature of the assessment here, um, looking at the goodness of fit, how well does the client actually fit into his or her environment? And, and um, of course, the physical environment is an area that's very important. Uh, is it a healthy environment? Is it a safe environment? Uh, you know, if, if, if you have a poor client living in Flint, Michigan, you know, with 
bad water, you know, lead lead laden pipes and those kinds of things. Uh, do, does your client live in a high crime area, or does your client live in a in a in an area where there are services readily available? Are there social support systems? Are there is the client does the client have a uh, subscribe to a spiritual life and it, as we've talked about elsewhere and we'll mention here spirituality and religion being very different things I'm not going to go through this list you can see it for yourself but there are a number of different things you want to look at uh, when you look at the client's environmental system I think I'm something like 14 or 15 different factors just that are mentioned in the text and and, and certainly there are even more than that I'm sure um, I, I think some things that are that are you know are really pretty important though is things like uh, you know again the the stability of, of the of uh, the physical environment and and the healthy healthy or lack or unhealthy nature of the environment uh, and the social support systems are are, are very critical you know what uh, what kind of uh, child care services are available or elder care services are available to your client uh, police and fire protection you know there's actually places in Alaska where um, uh, there is no fire protection I, I I never knew there. I mean I'm not talking about even uh, I mean I'm talking about communities on a road system that are developed and uh, it just boggled my mind when I learned that uh, but uh, those are, those are the kinds of things you want to look at when you assess the environment. Now, spirituality is something that, you know, has been mentioned more and more in the literature and in our in our textbooks and things. And, and I think it's good because this is a, an important thing uh, in the lives of many individuals. And, and um, I think sociologists would tell you whether or not you belong to a religion, whether you actively participate or not, your life is affected by religion and by uh, because religion is so closely tied to what the laws are in a society. You know, if, if you have a mainstream religion, uh, is what they're referred to, you know, the larger religions, in a society, the things that are considered to be sins uh, from a church perspective are also considered to be law violations in the larger community. So, so uh, I think it's safe to say that religion impacts all of us. And whether or not you have religion, it is very likely that an individual has a spiritual life uh, or spiritual beliefs, even if there is a belief that there is nothing spiritual about life, I suppose. So, so spirituality can act as a link to a faith community. And the, the text says that it does. I, I add, maybe it doesn't link to a faith community, but it can be a source of assistance and support and reflects our search for transcendence and meaning in a larger world. There are three areas uh, to look at in, in spirituality. You know, the, 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 what meaning do we give to current and personal events? That's the cognitive aspect. Um, how does one uh, feel connected? What sense of connectedness do, does, you have, does that person have to a larger reality? That's the affective portion of spirituality. And, and, and the behavioral, which is how are the beliefs affirmed or not? You know, do, does an individual go to church or, or does the individual pray or does the individual meditate or contemplate uh, or do, does the individual go to church but act like they have no faith, you know, act, you know, violate all the rules anyway? All those kinds of things are a part of, I think, the assessment. And there are some, there are some good spiritual assessments out there um, that lets you get at um, at the the individual's sense of spirituality in a more indirect way, and I'm not saying that we're we're trying to trick them into talking to us about their spirituality, but but uh, I think to a certain extent, in, um, perhaps individuals will often say they're not a spiritual person when in fact they have many spiritual things going on in their lives, and so um, uh, I think it is that association of spirituality with religion that oftentimes confuses these issues and religion being more more of the formal embodiment of spirituality as it mentions here this comes out of the um, Cornoyer text and, and it's just a little bit about you know as you've done the assessment and you develop this hypothesis so to speak about what's going on with the client and and uh, maybe where you go with this um, 
you know, Cornoyer, Cornoyer suggests a certain kind of steps. One of his, you know, asking the client what uh, his or her belief is about the issues that are going on and, and uh, you know, reflecting on, on those hypotheses um, and perhaps helping using your, your interviewing skills and your um, ability to, you know, your rapport building skills to help the client plunge deeper into those hypotheses to understand them perhaps a little bit better and and even to do a little critical thinking about whether or not their their uh, explanations their hypotheses have credibility um, and then to offer per our own change oriented hypothesis that uh, you know is connected to a, a, a strong logic and based on scientific theory and critical thought um, that's where that's where critical thinking and uh, and uh, evidence-based practice comes into play. And then, of course, recognizing the client's right is to accept or reject or our, our, uh, our hypotheses and proposing their own hypotheses in the end. In the end, it's the client's choice in, in, in this particular um, model. Now, again, remember, you have involuntary clients that are mandated to treatment and sometimes you're going to have to pursue goals with clients or pursue objectives the client may not be uh, buying into. But um, perhaps we can find steps in the process towards those objectives that the client will buy into. So, okay. So you're going to you write up your assessment probably and and. Uh, you know, you can do written assessments when you do intakes. That's oftentimes when we do assessments is when we're really first starting out. Um, or perhaps, you know, we've had a period of time where we've interviewed and gotten to know the client better, which is even a better assessment probably. Or at times when you transfer um, because you're leaving an agency or there's caseload change or a variety of different reasons why a client might transfer to another worker or in termination of services. Sometimes assessments are brief, sometimes they're very long, they're detailed, they can be very comprehensive. It just depends on the purpose and the setting and what's expected of you as far as, uh, you know, completing your, your role. But you want to avoid the use of labels and jargon and uh, subjective terminology as much as possible. Um, I say, be fa and, and, and the text says this, and I agree, be factual and describe things don't rely on labels and don't put your opinions in there or your views in, in in there that's as much as possible and and the same for case notes and i've mentioned this uh, in a previous lecture but but being objective and factual as much as possible and and uh staying away from perceptions and and uh um uh, theories and, and uh, judgments in, in your notes as well. And the same would be true for uh, written assessments. Case notes are oftentimes considered to be a burden, and they are a burden in many respects to workers. And even with the digital digitalization of case records, you know, I in child welfare, I, I know when we when I worked started working for uh, for the Office of Children's Services, I worked in, in uh, child protection in Florida in the 1970s and and then re-entered child protection specifically again in Alaska uh, in the 1990s and worked there for the next 20 years and one of the things that amazed me uh, in the course of those 20 years and I'm quite sure the Florida records reflect the same thing as the uh, Alaska records do because federal guidelines have intervened the the uh, the growth of the record itself I mean whereas you know there might be two volumes of a record for a family that in Florida might have gone back 20 years in dictation notes and things like that. Um, I have seen case records for families that were engaged with the system for a, a year that had expanded into six and seven volumes already. All sorts of case plans and evaluations and assessments and referrals and, and um, legal documents and those kinds of things the case case recording has exploded and, and it's become um, sometimes the focus of problems uh, or focus of work because of, well, malpractice considerations, billing considerations, accountability considerations. So your, your task is going to be, well, 
let me just say also that, you know, in the course of the last um, 10 to 15 years, I suppose, you know, little by little, uh, we've moved away from paper records and more to computer records, although rest assured, those paper records do continue to exist, sadly. But um, um, we've gone to digital records and which there are other issues with that. But but the theory is, is that it's going to be easier for uh, administration to look in. They don't have to fly into your office to look through the records now. They can tap a button and read what you're doing. That presumes that you're keeping your notes up to date. And there lies the rub because oftentimes I'm talking from a child perspective. Uh, child protection perspective, and I think this is true for other other types of work as well. Oftentimes, it's it's really very difficult, if not impossible, to get those notes in in a timely fashion, and that becomes a source of much uh, gnawing and gnashing of teeth in in agency work is is your case records. But the case notes are very important, and and uh, if you learn how to write what I call complete but concise notes. Ferret out what's important in your contact and report that. Don't report unnecessary things. Don't report, you know, this is something else we've gone over already. Case, case recording becomes much, much more possible. But it's very important for accountability and, and also to corroborate the delivery of, of, uh, of the services and, and uh, those kinds of things. And if something happens to you or if you move on, which often happens in social services, there's a record of what you've already done so clients don't have to be dragged back through the same thing over and over again. One format that is used, and this is the format that was used in the uh, mental health agency where I worked in Kenai, was the SOAP format. And subjective, what the client sees, objective, what, uh, what the practitioner observes, uh, and hears, so to speak, uh, assessment, which is what, how the practitioner views all this, how he puts it together, and, and a plan, which is what, what is next. What, uh, and this might include homework for the client. It might also mean things the worker is going to do. Uh, the SO format is, is common in, uh, in mental health agencies and uh, agencies where insurance companies do the billing. It also gives you a way to kind of structure your notes some. And again, if, you, if you're... Um, if you're a good, uh, if you're able to conceptualize what's going on and what what you have uh, accomplished what, with the client, you can do this in relatively short, um, relatively short uh, f format. So, but but um, any event, case notes very important. And another thing, if you're particularly if you're working for an agency where uh, billing is an issue, by the way. Um, your, you want your case notes to, ref, to, to reflect content related back to the treatment plan and assessment so that, you know, that uh, what you're doing is relevant. And it's not only for billing purposes, of course, because what you're doing should be contributing to the achievement of the goal that is established in the treatment plan. We're almost done here. <laughs> um, Preparing the assessment, you're going to, you know, develop explanatory hypotheses about the risk factors and the forces that affect and maintain problems. And so um, this is going to, you know, include strengths and assets and competencies and resources and protective factors. Um, the the uh, it also will will look at the client's motivation and readiness to address particular issues. And then to develop your change-oriented hypothesis, the who's going to be involved in it, what are the targets for change, what are the consequences, and what are the, uh, both positive and negative, you know, you have to look at the risks associated with the change that occurs. Um, consider the different intervention strategies and techniques that might apply and which is likely to be more successful, and then um, negotiate with your client the time frame for work and, and how you're going to go about evaluating that progress. Somehow this slide seems a little out of <laughs> out of place. I think I might have moved it up further. In the, but in any event, um, your biopsychosocial 
biopsychosocial assessment, uh, and perhaps this is a different thing. I don't know. It seems like this should have been earlier, but it really evaluates the biological, psychological, and social domains. And this is pretty much what we've been talking about, you know, and here the things that uh, you might, in the assessment itself, that you, categories or whatever, um, things that you would want to have there. That's that's what that's what brought this up. I, I saw this in the text. There was a biopsychosocial cycle one of those assessments in the text and and um, the different um, issues that they addressed in the written assessment these are the categories that were addressed and and this is not unlike our social history which if you look back here I'm going to go back a slide you see where it says social history in the middle of the of the list of things the biosocial psychosocial <laughs> assessment will have um, it isn't this complete social history. It's going to be a much shorter kind of a social history in a biopsychosocial. See, I can say that word assessment. But but uh, if you're, and this is what we often do in agencies, so psychiatric agencies in particular, and and uh, other other places where you're a participant in a multidisciplinary team. This is often the role of the social worker because they again they know we understand the connections between the client. Um, and, and all the systems that client interacts with, that that's our focus. Uh, and so we're the ones oftentimes who complete this social history. And here's a, a list of the different um, kinds of uh, sections and things to consider. Uh, uh, um, and again, this was uh, from the text. There's an example of a social history in the text. That, uh, and again, I say, be complete but concise. One of the things, there's a lot of areas to cover here. When you start writing about them, though, it you know it it doesn't it isn't quite as much as it may seem. But um, I, uh, I I I'll just tell you this: my when I was in my master's uh, internship, I I was uh, my my supervisor was a private practice uh, licensed clinical social worker, and I he wasn't working for the agency. I was I was doing my internship, and uh, because there were no social workers there to supervise me. And um, one of the things he would have me do from time to time was to bring a social history of a client that I prepared. And that was one of my roles there was to do social histories for all the um, uh, people coming in. These were young adults, adolescents and young adults in this psychiatric facility um, in Winter Park, Florida. And so I would do the social histories uh, as a part of their whole intake package. And my my supervisor would have me bring some social histories when I'd write them. And he commented upon how I was able to say so much in in such a short amount of uh, of words and so I that's where the complete but concise comes in for me I it can be done and if you make while we have a lot of things to say we have to sort through what's what's important I mean we have to hit all these important factors but I mean what we say about those factors really doesn't need to be you know long and involved um, keep it keep it focused and and uh, because if you write a document that's too long I'm just going to tell you this people aren't going to read it if you have a document that's concise people will read it and and uh, that's what you want so just keep that in mind when you when it comes time to uh, to write up whether you're doing a biopsychosocial or a social history or whatever kind of assessment you're doing okay that's it for this particular um, reading and um, what as always uh, I'm, I trust that there's something um, in this talk that you can take and to heart and make use of but uh, if not talk to me about it okay talk to you later bye